In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is the Feast of St. Pius X. So today's sermon will be on the life and virtues of this great saint of modern times. He was born in 1835 in a small village near Venice, the oldest of eight surviving children. His baptismal name was Giuseppe. His father was a mailman, and his family was poor. As a child, he developed a reputation for being very intelligent and zealous for his studies. He mastered reading and writing from an early age. When he was old enough, he began serving Mass at his parish. He was fascinated by the rubrics of Mass, so much so that At the age of only 10, he was appointed Master of Ceremonies, which meant that he had to ensure that all the rubrics of Mass were being carried out correctly, that all the servers knew what to do, carried out their duties, and maintained discipline. This he did with such a happy disposition that the other boys both respected him as a good leader and liked him as a friend. Some men are called to the priesthood later in life. St. Pius X was called early. Even when he was a child, people said that Giuseppe seemed born to be a priest. He loved to go and pray in chapel. And from an early age, he discovered in his prayer and meditation a wellspring of grace to which he would return throughout his entire life. The children of that town had to attend catechism classes taught by the parish priests. Giuseppe was always present for these classes, and he distinguished himself to the priests not only by his keen intellect, but also by the fact that his heart seemed consumed with love for the church's doctrines. Not all children went to school in those days, But the parish priest recommended that Giuseppe should attend school because of his abilities. So he enrolled at age 11. The school was nearly four miles away, and he walked there every day carrying his lunch. He always made a point of appearing clean and neat. In order to keep his shoes clean for school, he carried them instead of wearing them. These were better times in which parents had no cause to fear for the safety of children who were left on their own. When he got home from school, his parents assigned him chores to do. He had to milk the family cow and tend to the donkey and then do yard work. When he came inside, if he saw that his mother was getting behind in any of her housework, He helped her without having to be asked because she had many young children who needed her attention much more than he did. This routine accustomed him to self-denial. He attended school for four years and he scored the highest grades in every subject. He entered seminary at age 15 and was immediately a favorite of both the other boys and the faculty. His character was described as mentally quick, industrious, strong, mature, and extremely obedient. This training in obedience stuck with him throughout his life, even when he was Pope. He once said, in order to command, it is necessary to have learned to obey. His favorite subjects in school were sacred scripture and classes on the fathers of the church. The faculty also noted his musical talents and decided to make him director of the seminary choir. When his training for the priesthood was complete, he was only 23 years old, one year younger than the minimum age for ordination according to canon law. His bishop, however, was so impressed with him that he wrote to Rome to ask for a dispensation to ordain him early. He received the dispensation and was ordained a priest in September 1858. 
he was appointed parish priest in a small town. The pastor of that parish immediately took a liking to him, and after some time said, They have sent me a young man as curate with orders to form him to the duties of parish priest. I assure you, it is likely to be the other way around. St. Pius X said that work is man's chief duty on earth. Work was an occasion to become more like Christ, who was poor and in labors from his youth. He worked hard to fulfill his priestly duties, and this left a good impression on people who grew to respect him and love him. What occupied most of his time as a parish priest was teaching. He loved to give instruction in catechism, both to adults and to children. He often said that most of the evil in the world today comes from a lack of knowledge of God and of his truth. Catechism, for him, was a weapon of goodness with which to fight off the evils of the modern world. Music and art also occupied his time. He improved and beautified the parish church and put together a choir of mixed men and boys for singing Gregorian chant. At one point, there was an outbreak of cholera in the town. And for fear of infection, the dead had to be buried in the middle of the night, and no one was allowed to attend the burial. Don Giuseppe not only got up in the middle of the night and went to all of these burials, he also recited all the prayers and carried out all the burial ceremonies of the church. He even assisted the men in carrying coffins and helped to dig the graves. In 1875, he was appointed spiritual director of the local seminary. This job meant that he was responsible for hearing the confessions of seminarians, guiding them in the spiritual life, giving conferences, and teaching courses. He was stern in situations where a seminarian needed sternness, and gentle in situations where gentleness was needed. The seminarians were never tired when he spoke. They were never confused. He had a gift for making difficult subjects easy to understand and always interesting. He also had a great sense of humor. One day, he and a friend of his were on a train, and they overheard two men talking about the fact that a new bishop had been appointed to Mantua. Now, that bishop was Don Giuseppe himself, and he, of course, knew that he had been appointed to that position. But the two men did not know who he was. They assumed that he was a simple priest. And they were saying things like, this new bishop is probably not very smart, he is probably not very gifted, and Don Giuseppe approached them and said, you are right, he is not very smart, nor is he gifted. And then he began to list the qualifications necessary for a bishop, and afterwards said that this new appointee is far from fulfilling these qualifications. And as he was saying this, his friend managed to keep a straight face the whole time. And the train stopped, then Don Giuseppe got off first, then the men turned to his companion and said, who was that delightful priest that was speaking with us? And his friend said, that is the new bishop of Mantua. As bishop, he established schools, improved the seminary, rectified the diocese's financial condition, and visited all the parishes in the diocese. He made a rule that parents had to send their children to catechism classes with strict penalties if they were delinquent. He insisted that Gregorian chant be sung at all the parishes and at a high level. He had an unflinching devotion to the Pope, whom he called the guardian of holy scriptures, the interpreter of the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the supreme dispenser of the treasures of the church, the head of the Catholic religion, 
the chief shepherd of souls, the infallible teacher, and the secure guide. He said, All the strength of the church is in the Pope. Those who wish her evil assault the papacy in every possible way. They cut themselves adrift from the church and try their best to make the Pope an object of hatred and contempt. Let this statement sink in to the minds of those who are now openly resisting the man whom they claim to be the Pope, especially those who hold him up as the patron saint of their society. St. Pius X himself described them as those who wish evil upon the church and who cut themselves adrift from her. He was elected Pope in 1903 and took the name Pius. He said after his election, It matters not to tell with what tears and with what earnest prayers we have sought to thrust from us this appalling burden of the pontifical office. He saw the papacy as an enormous cross to bear, yet he bore this cross with tremendous resolve. Whenever he had to appear in public with the pomp and display that always accompanies such things, it was evident that the burden of his responsibility lay heavily upon him. At certain ceremonies, when the Pope entered St. Peter's Basilica and was within view of the people, the people had gotten into the habit of bursting into applause when they saw him. St. Pius X, when he became Pope, immediately put a stop to that, saying, it is not fitting that the servant should be applauded in the master's house. Shortly after his election, he set to work doing the same sorts of things that he had always done since his ordination, but now on a worldwide scale. One of his first acts was to insist upon an improvement in the quality of music in churches. He appointed a commission of scholars to create practical, singable editions of the Gregorian chant for the Mass and the Divine Office. He did not live to see the full fruits of this effort, but it resulted in a wonderful revival of Gregorian chant in the early and mid-20th century, not only in monasteries and convents, but even in parish churches. It is thanks to him that we today have access to the musical scores that we read from when we sing the chant. He was well known for his generosity toward the poor. He was always giving money and things away to people, to the extent that Vatican employees would occasionally ask him if such generosity was prudent. He always answered that God will provide. The problem of France, the political problem, presented itself early in his pontificate. France was in the throes of the wicked Third Republic, a government infested with rabidly anti-Catholic Freemasons and other monsters. They knew full well that the greatest impediment to the triumph of liberalism was the teaching of the Catholic Catechism to children. And so their plan was to wipe out Catholic education in France, to take away the church's schools so that children grew up ignorant of God, of Christ, and of the faith. By 1904, they had closed something like 17,000 Catholic schools. The encyclical Vehementer Nos bewails this terrible situation and is full of clear Catholic teachings on the subject of church and state. The revolution in Portugal, which was bitterly anti-Catholic, likewise caused great sorrow in the heart of St. Pius X. Now, there were voices at the time which suggested a compromise between Rome and these new liberal governments as a solution to the conflicts. But Pius X was not a man of compromise. Instead, 
he exhorted the clergy of France and Portugal to remain firm and to adopt a strong posture against the liberalism of those governments. As a result, the clergy of those countries suffered the loss of vast amounts of revenue, the loss of certain legal rights, and in some cases, the loss even of their homes. And yet, for St. Pius X, this was not a question of diplomacy or prudence. It was a question of right and wrong, and he knew that the clergy of these places would willingly suffer all these trials for the sake of Christ. St. Pius X often spoke on the importance of frequent confession and daily communion. He said, There is no vice that the regular frequentation of the sacraments will not extirpate. There is no moral resurrection beyond its power to effect. Holy communion is the shortest and surest way to heaven. It is so easy to approach the holy table, and there we taste the joys of paradise. He universally established the age for First Holy Communion at the seventh year, the age of the use of reason, which is still the age followed today. In 1907, he published his famous decree against modernism, Pascendi, and its follow-up syllabus, Lamentabili. He set up an institution called Sodalitium Pianum to discover and unmask modernists hiding among the clergy. He promulgated a new edition of the breviary, which brilliantly reconciled the Psalter with the sanctoral calendar without compromising either one. Now, if you are familiar with the history of the breviary, you can appreciate how difficult a task this was, and with what wisdom and pastoral prudence this breviary was created. He likewise oversaw a new edition of the Missal, which in its essential parts is the same Missal that we use today. He oversaw the creation of a single code of canon law to be observed throughout the Latin Church. For those familiar with legal history, one can scarcely begin to appreciate how monumental a task it was to codify into a single book all the ecclesiastical laws of an institution as old as the Catholic Church. And although he did not live to see its promulgation in 1917, he was the driving force behind its development. St. Pius X was also well known for miracles. A young girl in England had a strange condition in which her head and her neck were always covered in sores. These sores would not heal, so that she always had to wear bandages around her head and around her neck. Her mother took her to Rome to a papal audience, and when St. Pius X passed by her and blessed her in the middle of the huge crowd, she suddenly felt cured. She returned to her hotel, undid the bandages, looked in the mirror, and all of the sores were gone. Two nuns who were crippled from an incurable disease went to visit the Holy Father in a private audience, and they asked him for a cure. They were so sick and bent over that they could barely walk into the audience hall. He said to them, why do you want to be cured? They replied that we may work for God's glory. He said, have confidence, you will get well and will do much for God's glory. And they were cured instantly. They walked out of the hall upright and perfectly healthy. Their cure was so instant and so effective that their cab driver, who was waiting for them outside, did not recognize them as the same people, and he refused to allow them to get into his cab. In another audience, a man brought his little son to the Holy Father. His son was paralyzed from birth and had never been able to stand up 
in his entire life. St. Pius X took the child, picked him up and placed him on his knee and held him there. Then the Holy Father turned his head and began to talk to another group of people. A few minutes later, the child slipped down from the Pope's knee and stood upright. To the amazement of his father, he then started to walk and then run around the room. St. Pius X also performed miracles of conversion. A French atheist who was dying of heart disease received the Pope's blessing and afterwards was not only cured of her disease but also converted to the faith and was a fervent Catholic for the rest of her life. These are only a small sample of the many miracles that he performed. The outbreak of World War I was like an arrow to the heart of Pius X, and it struck him almost at the same time as his final illness. He died on August 20th, 1914. In our own times, looking back upon the destruction wrought by the errors of Vatican II, we can say that of all the acts of this great saint, the most important were his actions against modernism. All Catholics today should read The Condemnations of Modernism by St. Pius X, Pascendi and Lamentabili. The reason is that these teachings expose Vatican II for what it is, a political mission statement of liberals and modernists. God knew that Vatican II would happen, and he sent St. Pius X to the church in advance to rip down the whole intellectual edifice upon which it is founded. Saint pa- he revealed their plot to the world before their plot went into action. He called modernism an immense structure of sophisms which ruin and wreck all religion. This statement could easily describe the voluminous prattle of the Vatican II documents. He said, were anyone to attempt the task of collecting together all the errors that have been broached against the faith and to concentrate into one the sap and substance of them all, he could not succeed in doing so better than the modernists have done. Nay, they have gone farther than this, For as we have already intimated, their system means the destruction not only of the Catholic religion, but of all religion. His warning ought to echo in the ears of Catholics today. To bring an end to the present crisis in the Church caused by the modernism of Vatican II, we need a Pope like St. Pius X. We have suffered many decades of pseudo-popes who are trying to fool the world into thinking that they hold the keys of St. Peter, but they have desecrated the resting place of St. Peter by their lies and wickedness. Therefore, let us pray to this great saint on his feast day and ask that he bring an end to this crisis by granting to the Church a pope like himself, who will restore all things in Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.